There we go. More technical difficulty. Thank you for that beautiful song, for, the, for both of those. Amen. So what time is the concert this evening? 6 p.m. Beautiful concert. I know some hadn't arrived yet when we had our announcements. I wanted to make sure that you got that. And it's going to be a great concert of his voice, male. Boy, this thing's heavy. We've got a bigger one here. Ah. <clears throat> Why should I pray? Let me get my little pointer here. Well, I can think of a few reasons why I should pray. Psalm 50, verse 15, God says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will hear you, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. That's exciting. There's a lot going on there. I didn't even include that, but I got to thinking about it. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Anybody ever had a day of trouble? Do you think we're living in a day of trouble, just generally speaking? We, we're, 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 we're not in the time, the great time of trouble, but we're living in a general day of trouble. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. Now, that's a big deal. The word deliver is I will save you. I will rescue you. I will bring you whatever you need. I will help you. And you shall glorify me. Now, there's a big reason to pray right there, just so I can glorify God. I can't even glorify God unless I call upon God. There's no way, there's no hope. I don't have a chance of glorifying God unless I call upon Him. My life cannot do it. I need Him to produce that kind of righteousness, that kind of power, that kind of ability, that kind of beauty, before I will ever glorify Him. And then he tells us, in, and this is before, this is like the pre-sermon. So in John 16, verse 24, I've been trying to memorize this verse for years. And I've, it finally clicked on me this morning because it took me, I don't know how many years to memorize the verse that says that God will help my memory. It, it, it took me years to memorize the verse that says God will help my memory. That's John 14, 26. And, and that's an amazing verse. And he says that he'll bring to my memory all the things that I've ever heard from him. It, it just, it's very humbling for God to show us, at least to me, it's very humbling for him to show me how really helpless and weak and, and defective I really am because it literally took me a couple of decades to lock that verse. And Charlie's laughing. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. <laughs> That's okay. I'm laughing too, Charlie. I'm laughing too. I can't tell you how long I tried, how many times I tried to memorize John 14, 26. And it was very humbling that every time I'd want to find it in the Bible, I couldn't find it. And I'd have to go to my concordance. And I'd see it and I'd go, oh yeah, John 14, 26 is where God says he'll, he'll, he'll help my memory. <laughs> I mean, it literally... I know why it took God so long because of the, of the product he was working with here. He was working with this product here. And it literally took God, I'm trying to think, you know, I've been preaching for 39 years, so it literally took him about 25 years. Now that's a pretty humbling testimony. And it was worse every time I had to go look it up. And I couldn't remember where it was. And now I got this verse where Jesus says that we should ask, we should pray so that our joy may be full. Why should I pray? So that I can be full of joy. And I've, I've never really been able to lock that one in either. I've always had to go look it up. Until this morning. 
This morning, he burned this into my mind. It's burned. It's there. I know it is. Just like I knew when he, when he, when he finally burned John 14, 26 into my, my mind. And, and, and he also, at the same time, he burned John 16, 13 into my mind. Because John 16, 13 goes with John 14, 26. And if you don't have those two verses operating in your life, you better get them today. You better get them immediately in your life. And if you don't think you need the promises of God, then you got a big, big, big problem. And you're in for a big, 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 rude awakening. And we need God's word. Amen. And we need these promises locked in big time. So now, well, for 10 or 12 or 15 years, I've had John 14, 26. But now I've got John 16, 24. Do you hear it? John 14, 26. John 16, 24, you just switch two numbers, click, and now I've got that one. Now I know. Some of you may be saying, man, he's a pastor. I thought pastors were supposed to be smarter than that. Or, man, isn't that all he does is just sitting around reading his Bible? He never does anything else, does he? Huh. I remember one day I did a funeral, and that, e that day I dedicated a baby, and the next day I uh, started an evangelistic series, and she's about as pretty as you can get. And in the middle of, of doing the evangelistic series, I moved to Arlington Church. And, and this week was incredible. I've had some tougher and, and bigger weeks, but man, I don't know when, when it was. I didn't do any funerals or any weddings or any baby dedications, but I tell you, sometimes people can really get into some situations. And it's good to be able to be a, a peacemaker or a, a healer, to be an instrument in God's hands. So anyway... I've got John 14, 26 locked in. John 16, 13 is locked in. And John 16, 24 is now locked in. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Why should I pray? So that my joy can be full. And, 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 the greatest joy I can have is knowing that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are pleased with me. And the, and the first way to please the Godhead is to call on Jesus. Because in Acts 2, he says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that makes God so happy when he gets to save a sinner. I don't think anything makes him happier than that. In fact, all of heaven rejoices when one sinner calls on Jesus. If just one. For the first time. Or if one has drifted away. Wandered off into confusion and, and strange life. If they think to themselves, here I am. I'm eating with the pigs. Just like the prodigal son. I will arise and go back to my father's house. The church. The house of prayer. And I will go back and I will see if he will receive me back. And the answer is yes, he will receive you back. So why should I pray? So God can deliver me, heal me, so that my life can glorify him. That's a big deal. Why should I pray? So that my joy can be full and the greatest joy of my life is when the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit look upon me and say, this is my son, and I am a son in Christ. This is my servant 
and I am a servant in Christ. This is my friend, and I am a friend in Christ, in whom I am well pleased. Man, that's exciting. Here's what Paul says. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. I don't know exactly what that means, but I know Jesus is at the top. I know Jesus is in charge. He is the second Adam. He has taken the place of the fallen Adam. He has been exalted at the right hand of the Father on high, not only as the Son of God, but also as the Son of Man. And the whole family is named under Jesus. There's only one Savior in the universe. His name is Jesus. That he would grant you, this is why Paul prayed, this is why I pray that God, through Jesus, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That might is dunamis, dynamite, power, energy, explosive power, energized through his spirit. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of God, Lord of hosts. Anybody know where that's at? Where's that at? It's a promise. Someday, somebody may need that promise, and you may tell them, well, here's a promise, I'll tell you about it. And they say, well, is that really in the Bible? Well, yeah, well, where is it? Well, I don't know. Well, then how do you know it's in the Bible? i tell you what. You need to be ready. Sharpened. Zechariah 4, 6. And it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And he says, this mountain shall be removed. And Jesus in Mark 11, verse 23, 24, he talks about moving mountains with a mustard seed of faith. And that's what Zechariah was talking about. And that's what Paul's praying about. He's pray, he bends his knees, and he's a prayer warrior so that the body of Christ may be strengthened so that you individually, me individuals, can be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in agape, God's love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love, the agape of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This explains to me why Jesus says in John 14, 12, if you believe in me, he says, you'll do the very works I have done. And greater works you shall do, because I'm going to the Father, in verse 13, and I will pray to the Father, and he will answer, and he will bless you. The fullness of God? How else do you think Peter and James and John and Paul went around raising dead people to life? How did they do that? They had Christ in them. They, had, they didn't just have a little bit of Christ, they had the fullness of of God in them. When they spoke to death, death obeyed them because Jesus was in their voice. He was in their soul. He had saturated them. He had baptized them through the Holy Spirit. And when they spoke to death, death obeyed their voices. It's huge. They're no better sinners than you and me. It's who they had in them that made the difference. They had the fullness of God in them. Wow. And when those, I mean, Peter, what a a jerk. What a boastful, bragging blowhard. The guy probably told the worst jokes in the world, too. And they were probably dirty jokes. And he was just a klutz. 
He was obnoxious. He was overbearing. And if my old buddies were hearing this, they'd probably think I was talking about myself. But even Peter, you call on Jesus and he gives you a life worth living. You call on Jesus, he delivers you. He delivered Peter and he, he caused Peter to be able to glorify the name of Jesus. Peter would walk down the streets. His shadow would fall on sick people and demon possessed people. And boom, 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 boom. They were healed and delivered and miraculously saved. And it was incredible. It's recorded in the book of Acts. And it's not a fairy tale. Elijah, Elisha, Moses. God's been doing this stuff for 6,000 years. It's not like he just started doing this stuff in the book of Acts. He's been doing this stuff for any sinner who will call on the name of the Lord. That's how real this is. The fullness of God, that you may be filled with the fullness of God, it's huge. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us, have you allowed the risen Christ into your soul? Have you heard him knocking? Do you hear him knocking? And do you answer that that convicting power of holy grace? Do you answer that by saying, Yes, come into my life. Be my strength. Be my wisdom. Be my hope. Be my all in all. Be my righteousness. Be to me all that I need. Have you answered that call? And allowed this power, dynamite, dunamis, dynamite, into your soul. The Holy Spirit comes knocking every day. He comes knocking every single day. How are we answering? How are we answering? I think I lost a verse here. Oh, no, here it is. Here it is. I just read it. We got to look at this for a minute. Right there. I know some people with some big imaginations. I know some people who know how to ask God for some big things. And he's saying here that God's going to outdo anything. He's going to outdo anything you could ask or even think. Anything you could imagine, God will do exceedingly abundantly above it. Man, I know some people with some big imaginations. I know a guy in the Bible with a big man. His name was Elisha. And Elijah told him, he, Elisha said, where are you going? And he goes, I'm leaving, man. I'm, I'm getting ready to fly right on out of here. And he says, I'll tell you what, Elisha, if you, get, if you, if you stay close, if you stay with me, if, if you don't lag behind, if you see me caught up and go up into heaven, God will give you whatever you ask. And Elisha unleashed his imagination. He, and he says, what would, you, what would your request be, Elisha? And Elisha says, Elijah, here's my request. I want double what God gave you. I want double. And you know, Elijah must have thought, hmm, boy, these young kids, they sure got a lot of nerve around here. <laughs> but I have a feeling Elijah admired this young whippersnapper. He said, good for you. I don't think he said it out loud, but he probably said, that's what we're talking about, Elisha. That's what we're talking about. Sure enough, the chariot of Israel came. Elijah got on. Man, don't you want to see an instant replay of that when we get to heaven? Elijah got on and whoosh, whoosh, swept up into heaven, and as he went, his cape, his mantle, I mean, Superman's not the first person that had a cape, 
And neither was Batman. Are you kidding? Elijah had the cape, man. And his mantle, which is a cape, goes flouting back down to earth. And Elisha grabs it with all his might, with all his heart. And man, he's ready. He's ready. He he's, says goodbye to Elijah. Well, he's gone. Time to go to work. He comes walking back to the River Jordan. And the River Jordan is flooding. and it, Not flooding, but it's, it's at the banks and it's flowing. And he hits that river with the mantle of Elijah. And he looks. And I'm sure he held it up into heaven. And he says, where is the God of Elijah? And the God of Elijah, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, parted that water for Elisha just like he had just done it for Elijah. He walked over on dry ground, and man, he shook the world for Jesus. And he died. And somebody said, well, why didn't God catch him up like he did Elijah? Because God was going to use him his one last act to do the great miracle of resurrection. He's dead. They bury him. And a while later, there's a, there's a, a, a funeral entourage. And they're going out to bury this fella. And the raiders, the robbers, and the vandals, they come sweeping down to, to steal and to cause misery. And they threw the dead body into this tomb. Didn't know who's, it was Elijah's, Elisha's. Threw the body in there. When his body hit the bones, boom, he sprang to life and came flying out of that tomb. And that's what the Bible says. Amen. Well, you know, it looked like he was flying. He was probably running. But I'm sure he was stepping pretty high. Man, wouldn't you have liked to have been there when that happened? Now, I don't know what else happened. We're going to have to wait to find out. But I have an idea that those robbers got spoiled. I got an idea there's so much holy power breaking out there in that place that the robbers just freaked and ran. Now, I don't know. It's not in the Bible, but I'm going to find out. That's another question I'm going to find out. Someday in heaven. I'm going to ask that guy. When you sprung back to life, what would you do to those robbers? He says he's able to do more than you can ask or think. According, here's the condition, according to the power that works in us. Now the condition is whether or not you're allowing the gospel to work in you or not. I have a very dear friend. I played college football with him. Colorado State University. He was as wild as wild can be. I, I mean, I was kind of crazy, but he made me look like, a, like an altar boy. And he's from Long Beach. Thank California for that. He's from Long Beach. Came back to Colorado to play football. Just as crazy and ornery and just amazing guy. <laughs> and I tried to witness to him after I got saved and converted. And I tried to witness to him. And, and his, his roommate, Bruce, tried to witness to both of them. And they kind of laughed at me and thought I was crazy. I think it was... About 25 years later, he called me, wanting to know where I lived. I don't know how, he found my number, he wanted to know. He called Hooker, Oklahoma, asked somebody in Hooker, do you know Paul Lundgren? They said, oh yeah, we know Paul Lundgren. Do you have his number? Yeah, we got his number. They gave, me, gave him his, my number. I was living 20 miles from him after 20 some years. He called me because he wanted to know about Jesus. And that's amazing. And that's exciting to me. And he sent me an email because somebody sent him some Bible study on the Holy Spirit that was kind of discouraging and made him feel like that he, he, he couldn't be, he wasn't saved. That, you know, he wasn't currently saved in Christ. And so I got to talk with him and talk about that. Can you imagine how much joy that is? Amen. That's incredible. And, and Paul Lundgren can't do those things. It's the power that works in us 
that does these things. If we allow it, that's the If I allow God to do this, he will use me. He, he wants to use you as much as he used Moses. Somebody says, well, how could he say that? Moses was the greatest man that ever lived in the Old Testament, and blah, 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 blah. Well, you don't understand God. If you think God loved Moses more than he loved you, you do not understand. If you think God can use Moses or use Moses more than he can use you, you don't understand. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can even ask or think. Now, I know most of what God did through Moses. And God says he can do more than I know. He can do more through you or me than he did through Moses. That's why Jesus said, if you believe in me, John 14, 12, the very things I have done you shall do also, and greater things shall you do, because I'm going to the Father. Amen. Somebody says, well, how can that be true? Jesus didn't, he didn't really mean that. Are you kidding me? You're going to sit around and try to philosophize and figure out how many angels can sit on the top of a head of a pen. And, and before you, and in the meantime, there's people all around you suffering and, and being blown away by Satan. And you're out here, going, well, Jesus couldn't have meant that. I can't go out there and do the works of Jesus. He couldn't have mean that. Do you? Well, he couldn't mean that. Stop already. Get up. And go for. Why? For the glory, so that there'll be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to the first century Christians. To the, to the Book of Acts Christians. They're the only ones that got all this good stuff. We're just going to have to tough it out and slug it out and make it if possible. No, to all generations. Forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the book of 1 John, here's, here's the testimony of Jesus. The book, book of first, it's all through the Bible, but here's, here's some of it. First John 5. Uh, you know, I don't know how, 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 much you, how much time you spend in First John. And I don't know how much time you spend in First John 5. But if, it, if at this very moment you do not know that you are saved in Jesus Christ and that you at this very moment have eternal life in your soul, that you have eternal life. If you do not possess that, if you don't know for sure that you possess eternal life right now, then you need to spend a whole bunch more time in, in 1 John 5. Especially verse 11, 12, and 13. We are, we are getting beat up. We're getting slaughtered. We're getting minimalized. We're getting diminished on a daily basis. The world, Satan's world, is rolling against the church like a steamroller. And casualties are being taken, and I'm not talking about the martyrs and the people that are being killed around the world by religious extremist psychomaniacs. I'm talking about we are taking casualties. We're not even teaching the truth the way we should be, not even in our homes let alone to our neighbors. Now here's the deal. How many of you know who Joel Osteen is? How many of you know he has a church they meet and there's about 12,000 people in the church building? How many of you know he takes in millions of dollars every week? How many of you know he just says happy, pleasant, wonderful, power of positive thinking, and it, it's really good. We need all that. We need, well, mo maybe not all of it, but we need most of that. We need th those kind of things in our lives. But we don't need just that. We need a balanced diet. We need to be reminded how weak we are. And we need to be reminded where we get our strength and who we're living for. And we definitely need to be reminded what the definition of sin is.
Hey, I, people can slam and criticize and judge and condemn Joel Osteen all they want. I don't have time to be doing that. I want to I get whatever good things are coming out of his life and stick it in with the other good things that are coming from somewhere else and try to become a balanced minister of the gospel. And if you think no good things coming out of him, you do not understand God. God can bring good things out of a donkey. And if he can bring good things out of a donkey, I know he can bring good things out of Joel Osteen. He can bring good things out of a Buddhist. I've learned good things from Buddhists. I don't learn how to get to heaven from a Buddhist, but I learn how to be a good person, a, a healthy person, a, a disciplined person. I learn some beautiful things from Buddhists. I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out what I can learn from Muslims. I'm open. I'm trying to look for good things. I'm trying to find some good things that I can learn from those folks. And used to, I think I was able to learn a few good things. But now that some of them, not all of them, but some of them are doing so many ugly, terrible, disgusting, vile things. It's, it's, just, it's just broken my heart. And it's caused a great, uh, a great shock. I think I'm in shock. And I, and I hear the word Muslim, and all I can do is just weep and just wonder... How in the world can this be happening? But we need power. We need power to forgive. These, and I talked about this last Sabbath. We need power to forgive these extreme religious psychomaniacs. If you do not have this kind of power, your joy will not be full. If you do not forgive, and Jesus said this. Now, you can think he just didn't know what he was talking about all you want. But Jesus said, if you don't forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. I'm sorry, I didn't say it. That Jesus said that. If you've got any unforgiveness in your heart, I beg you to deal with it. By surrender. And forgive. I was telling Esper, I said, <laughs> and I remember I was preaching in the Sunday churches. And, and, and I remember Oral Roberts, um, Rex Humbard, and there was a couple other guys who were trying to recruit me, and they were trying to train me and mentor me. And, all this. and man, those guys were having a blast. That was back when Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagen and, and, and Oral Roberts, and all, they were just really really having a big time. And, and they were trying to recruit me. I remember them. They, they, they'd have I'd meet them for breakfast and we'd talk and they'd try to tell me that I needed to join with them and become part of their group and blah, 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 blah. And as I prayed about it, the Lord said no. And I was telling Esper, I think it was yesterday, I said, man, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, Unfortunately, it's kind of too bad that I just can't preach all the good stuff like Joel Osteen, all the fun stuff and all the make you feel good stuff and all the inspirational, motivational stuff. It's too bad I can't do that. And it's like, it's like, how do you do that? When you know people are being deceived. When you know people are being led to believe that repentance is no longer necessary. Well, why do you pray? Why do I pray? You know, I, I, I've been praying for a long time. But every time I read this, I see how much further I need to go. To know the love of Christ. To be filled with the fullness of God.
I hate to be the one that has to tell you this, but our society and our culture is going to hell in a handbasket. Forty years ago, the TV entertainment was Bonanza, The Rifleman, uh, Andy Griffith. And they actually, had, they actually had times where they quoted Bible and they prayed and they talked about God and they talked about doing things the right way, the Christian way. And they actually had conversations like that in those old movies. And they had morals to their stories. There's actually Bible studies. You can order a whole series of Bible studies based on Andy Griffith. And you watch a segment, and then you go have this Bible study. They had these church, they had church choirs. They had church services going on. Godly, humble, good church services that happened in those series, in those things. Nowadays, they're doing everything to convince you that sin is not sin. That sexual perversion is not sin. That God is dead. That the universe evolved from a blob of slime that got hit from some lightning or something. And they can't tell you where the lightning came from or where the blob came from. But it was billions and billions and billions of years ago. And the Bible is a joke. And that's, what, that's what's poured forth. You know, <laughs> it's been quite a while since anybody asked me, Pastor, when's our next prayer vigil? And I've just been waiting. And it's been a, quite a while. And it's like, what do you do? And I'm just going to lay this out. You guys can do whatever you want to with it, but here's the truth. You should be calling each other and saying, hey, you want to come to my house? We'll have a prayer vigil Saturday night at my house. And then a month from now, we'll do a prayer vigil at your house. That's the family of God. That's the body of Christ. That's the community of the book of Acts. They didn't wait for the pastors to come along and kick them in the rear end and say, hey, we need to have a prayer vigil. They were doing it themselves. The deacons were doing it. Philip, Stephen, these guys were deacons. If you wait for the pastor to come along and get you on the gospel train of the latter rain, then you're going to miss that train for sure. Now you can spit that out or swallow it. But I guarantee you, it's the truth. You need to be stirring each other up like never before. Christianity is under attack. There's a steamroller moving through this earth and the devil is at the helm. Why should I pray? Because when I pray, God puts me in a fortress. He puts me in a hiding place. He puts me in the shelter, the shadow of the Almighty. When I call on Him, He delivers me. For some people here today, the answer to why should I pray is because I haven't been praying. That's another big reason why you should be praying. And as we close... I actually thought this service, this sermon was going to be a lot shorter. Because there wasn't very many verses. God is calling. Seventh day Adventist of all people should know better than to do what they're doing on the Sabbath hours. And I'm not going to spell it out to you. You go read Nehemiah 13. You go read Isaiah 58. You go read Mark 2. And if you don't know what's in those verses, I would encourage you to beg God 
for mercy. We need to know who we are in Christ. As we close, we're going to sing a song. And I, didn't, I forgot to tell Lorna, but it's in the hymn book, and I know it's one of her favorites. It's number 495. 495. Our lives are so busy... Our lives are so busy, we, we may take two minutes to pray before we leave the house. A quick, we may pray as we're driving out of the driveway. We may shoot up a quick 10-second prayer. You know, I know these things because I have been there. I know that's what we do because I've done that. That's who I used to be. That's who I've been. And that's who I could become again if I allow the flesh to rise up and take over. I know. We got to make this appointment with God. We, and we can't say, God, I'm going to keep this appointment. We got to say, God, you've got to keep this appointment because I'm a miserable, wretched, weak, defective, fallen sinner. And if you don't think that's true, then go on, go, go for it. See how far you get. I'm hoping that in the next few weeks, that I will begin to get reports from this congregation. The people will begin to tell me, guess what, Pastor, what? Oh, so-and-so called me and asked me to come to their house and have a prayer vigil. Man, we had a prayer vigil. It's better than anyone that I ever saw you leading. Man, it was great. The Holy Spirit came over and he was in charge. I'd say hallelujah. Amen. That's the kind of report the pastor's waiting to hear. Primitive godliness. Ancient righteousness. The enemy is attacking. He's got most of us lulled to sleep. Most of us have blinders on. We can't even see it. We can't even recognize it. We don't even know how serious it is, but it's serious. I invite you to stand as we sing all three verses near to the heart of God. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where all that cannot molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sit from the heart of God hold us who wait before thee near to the heart of God there is a place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God a place where we our Savior meet Near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee. Near to the heart of God. Just before we sing this third verse, for those who would like to, I just invite you to come forward as a, as a token or as an expression or, or, or whatever reason you want. Maybe you just want to come up here and see whether I'm as short as I really look. <laughs> but whatever reason, make sure Jesus is in the middle of that reason. He'll do something special. I sing the third verse. There is a place of full release 
near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Unmistakably, unquestionably, undoubtedly, God has been trying to get us to pray with each other in each other's homes long before I even thought about it. He knows who we are. He knows how weak the flesh is. Some of the greatest followers of Christ couldn't even stay awake the night he needed him the most. He knows. But he also knows the difference that is made when we receive the Holy Spirit. Those same guys led the world to Jesus. They shook the world for Jesus. They were losers. They were just losers and the power of God came into their lives they shook the world for Jesus that's what God wants to do through you and me in a big way and, and I don't think you'll do this but in case somebody might be crazy enough to do it don't ever use me for your model. He wants to use you in a much greater way than he's ever used me. He wants to use you and work through you the same way Jesus worked when he was here, not the way I do it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we don't even know, at least I don't, how, how far we've drifted away from the, from the way the church in the book of Acts lived. We have so many more things to be doing on Saturday night than to be having a prayer vigil. It just boggles the mind why you would even suggest that we should have a prayer vigil on Saturday night in our home. Please forgive us. Please rescue us. Please lead us in the footsteps of Jesus. We want the testimony of Jesus so that we can be victorious. Lord, if there's anybody here that came into this gathering today not following Jesus, I pray that they will follow him out of this gathering and that they will follow him so closely that the next time I see them, that they will be just bubbling and overflowing with the beauty of Jesus. We give it all to you. We know we can trust you. We love you so much. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And the church says, amen, amen. amen. God bless you as you go. May you go in the power of Jesus. Amen.